is very essential for modern life like we interact with energy all the time like right now i'm talking to you through my laptop the internet everything is running basically on energy so how, how even though we are so close to it but not a lot of time we understand what exactly is happening and where is technology in terms of data science is coming into the picture like what kind of work we are doing so i'll give you a brief about this this is very important again because uh, i'll come to that because if you're trying to solve a problem you need to have a proper problem statement like what are you even trying to solve like why are you doing something so for that i'll just give you a brief about like how this whole energy system is it will be very in a very simplified uh, way uh, this i this is very over simplified version of what actually happens but this will give you an idea what's happening so the the whole journey starts from where the energy is being generated so it it can be generated through coal natural gas or wind or solar uh, so the whole the process where energy is transferred uh, transformed into electrical energy is called generation so these are usually happening on like some farms which are far away from cities so you 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 need that energy which is being generated to come uh, and transport to basically the city where it's been uh, it is required so this is done through power lines so in power lines we uh, transport electricity and it is transported at a high voltage to so that we can reduce the energy loss which happens during transportation and once it reaches the city we use it, there are substation which can basically transform that into a lower voltage which can be then sent to homes and businesses the office or basically where you are so in your home so that you can use that um, uh, electricity so this is the cycle now if i have to tell you so there are there are two things which can be easily seen one is the supply side so electricity is being produced at this uh, if you can uh, if you have to bifurcate the process one is like at this place we are uh, generating the electricity so we are up supplying the electricity to the grid and on this side we are consuming the electricity so it is where we are demanding the electricity so now now comes the technical part so according so right now one thing we have to know is supply should always equal to the demand so this is the problem that we face and that's where we come in so let me explain this to you further so when the electricity is coming so why so the grid always needs to maintain the frequency grid is where electricity is flowing so frequency like i don't want to get too technical but frequency uh, of an electrical grid is the number of cycles of alternating current per second so basically every grid is um, it has a fixed frequency at which it operates so in india it's 50 hertz in uh, us canada it's 60 hertz so this is fixed so this the grid needs to maintain its frequency because electricity needs to supply at home and if the uh, frequency is something else if it's not like for example in india it's not 50 hertz then it can cause electrical e equipment whatever we are using through that electricity to malfunction or even damage the equipment and in some cases which is uh, rare but very 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 dangerous is it can lead to power outages which can basically mean there is blackout in the whole area for maybe days so this is something we have to avoid so that means the frequency has to be always uh, in uh, 50 hertz or like very uh, small margin of error is there which you can do but it can't go above or below that now the question comes like how do we maintain that frequency to maintain that frequency it it is basically as simple as that the demand should equal to be uh, to the supply this means the amount of electricity being generated by the power plants must be batched by the amount of electricity being consumed by homes and businesses if there is if basically if there is too much demand if like it's peak uh, summer season and i i'm talking to you from delhi so if i'm in delhi and it's peak summer season it's very hot so sometimes like temperatures can touch as high as 47 degrees 48 degrees you tend to demand you tend to put your acs and fans and everything working and all over delhi this will be happening so this can uh, uh, basically lead to too much demand and not enough supply so this can affect the frequency of the grid and it can decrease uh, similarly if there is too much supply that uh, supply so that can affect the frequency and it can increase so that's where the whole job that we are doing comes in so what we are trying to do is we are trying to 
forecast from the supply side so for example if i have a client who has a solar plant so i try to forecast how much electricity will that solar plant will produce and in india so it, the india follows the grid uh, scheduling in 15 minutes so the grid operates in every 15 minutes so i have to forecast in every 15 minute what will be the generation of electricity through that solar plant and similarly if i am a discom discom is a basically a company which distributes electricity to the final user so in delhi there are five discoms like ndmc drpl byypl tpddl so and in other states like in up it's the state electricity board and i think it's more mostly it's always state so these are uh, discoms so these provide elec electricity to the end user so they also have to tell the grid how much electricity will be required by the people of that state so that they can tell and accordingly the grid operator can balance things so he knows how the supply is coming he knows how the demand is coming so then he balances now what happens is as you can imagine with uh, the coming of renewable energy like wind farm solar energy so now the supply can become a bit variable because earlier it was just coal so you put x amount of coal you will get y output but now wind energy solar energy they are dependent on weather like if for example there is a cloud uh, during the day so the solar energy uh, the solar which is uh, uh, producing something the output will be uh, will be less because there was a cloud so the panels were not getting enough uh solar radiation so this these are the things that we as uh, data scientists will have to take care of when we are trying to build the model okay um, maybe tomorrow 12 to 12:15 the uh, the output of, from the plant will be lesser because we are seeing there is a cloud there so i won't go in the workings right now but i hope you get the idea why this work is so important so we have to be very accurate from the demand side and the, if you are like doing forecasting how much will be the demand by the city of delhi so we have to be very accurate and in every 15 minute windows so this is how this is why like the this thing is important and another reason is because our clients so they are uh, charged penalties from the grid uh, operator if they do a wrong uh, if they tell wrong values for example if delhi people say uh, any discount in delhi say we will require x amount of uh, electricity tomorrow at 12 pm but because there was a, a very it was very humid so people started opening their ac so the actual load they required is x plus 100 megawatt so what will happen is Uh, because their forecast was wrong they will have to either go in the last moment somehow ask the grid to buy more electricity which will be much more expensive so this will be again uh, some uh, they'll have to pay more so it's like a kind of a penalty and somehow it will also get transferred to the end consumer so our job is to like do the best forecast so that there is less less amount of there is no penalty that's the ideal case but as you know like the job is to minimize the penalty minimize everything and this helps in like less power cuts less electricity bills so i hope now you get the idea why the problem statement is so important so <clears throat> that's how like uh, this is again again i'm focusing on like forecasting demand is very important so coming back to the presentation so as i said i told you about two sides demand side and supply side today i will be focusing on uh, focusing on the demand side like the where like i am working with a suppose some state and we want to predict what will be the demand for that state next day in every 15 minute time block so in a day there will be 96 time blocks now obviously the data science part we know we will run a, we will put the data of load it's a time series data we will choose any algorithm we want we'll have a target variable we'll try to forecast it we'll get some accuracy number this is there like but the point is uh, what uh, which is very important is actually understand why what is important why, how is load moving is there any pattern we can see is there a, just a correlation or it, does it actually mean causal uh, causation so these are very important things that we i in this session want to focus on maybe it won't be the most advanced data science technique you will learn today 
but i hope you learn this habit of like actually giving more time on spending um, on eda basically understanding data as deep as possible so i am pretty sure most of you almost all of you know what eda is but still it is basically an approach to analyze data and their main characteristics through statistical graphic graphs and visualization methods so it helps us in finding patterns identify anomalies outliers maybe test uh, some of the assumptions and hypotheses which we already know through data so eda can be one of the best tools for data scientists like i have written four five points just to summarize it it actually helps in understanding data and data patterns so well like you can easily it's so intuitive like for example even when you make a model and if you want to show the findings of the model so mostly you will prefer to show findings to uh, maybe the final stakeholder holder in terms of visualization or just the summary statistics no one wants to know like what exactly is happening and to make them understand how is it happening data visualization is one of the best tools so i have pointed out some three points which i think is very important when you are doing eda and which are i would say necessary for doing a good eda job or maybe before data pre processing the things you should follow so one is always have a well defined problem statement so once you get the job understand why are you doing this um uh, modeling whatever the target variable you are trying to predict or whatever the problem statement is be very careful what you are uh, trying to do and before the eda try to have a problem statement for example i want to understand every pattern about how the load is like even if i have just i am given just the load series in the time series data but i want to understand how the load is moving so i will try to dig as deep as possible maybe load is moving in this day differently in that day differently so be as detailed as possible but have a problem statement so that you are writing down documenting everything uh, why exactly you are doing that the second thing is level the data set and reiterate so basically what happens is sometimes you are going inside eda and you found something interesting and you tend to follow that and then you find something interesting so you go into a rabbit hole and you forget about the orig uh, the original uh, problem statement so one suggestion always would be to uh, even if you find something interesting write it down again document it properly then finish your analysis and then go to that and maybe it's a big cycle like you tend to go deeper 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 but the point is better and third thing which i think uh, nowadays uh, people are realizing much more because data science is being used in almost all domains like as a data scientist i might not even know some medical if i start working for a maybe a, a company which works in uh, medicine or something so i can be part of their data science team i can start running models okay if this drug is effective or not all those kind of things even though i am not from the domain so the best thing you can do is always always whenever you are doing eda Uh, ha like share your findings with a domain expert like sometimes you can find domain expert in your own company sometimes you don't so maybe reach out to someone even i am pretty sure the domain experts will also be very fascinated by seeing so much data validating something or not or maybe uh, showing something shocking maybe you get even deeper into those things so it will always help so these are the three points which i always follow when i am doing eda and uh i'm doing data pre processing so again uh, the point is uh, uh this is one point again from my um, education background i have learned so we as economist we as uh, data scientists we as statisticians we are so uh, fascinated by correlations so because correlations are easy to calculate you can and it actually helps the model if the, uh, if there are correlated variables but uh i think we should also focus on causation and which basically means try to understand the data much more and uh, to give you a small exa example i think once we uh, go into this journey of like understanding correlation and what is the difference between correlation and causation so we do come ac across this spurious correlations and uh, uh, confounding uh, variable which is basically said 
So I have a very small example of how these uh, uh, spurious correlation. What does it actually mean? So it means when two things are occurring together. So on in the data, when you find the correlation, they will be highly correlated. But re in reality, they have nothing to do with each other. Maybe there is a third variable which is affecting, uh, which is basically making the both the things occur together. So when you are maybe building a model, you tend to just focus on correlation and maybe the third factor which you were trying to which was basically affecting the both the uh, uh, both the variables together it's not there anymore and suddenly you will see okay where is the correlation gone so instead of and this will happen if you straight away go and run the uh, uh, algorithms run the model without doing a proper deep down eda because then even though you will still continue you might continue to use the same the highly correlated variable but you will know why this is uh, like there is uh, some external factor which is affecting. Maybe you try to track that fa factor down. So yeah. So if you see like this is a website which just talks about spurious correlation. So you see U.S. spending on science, space, and technology is highly correlated with suicides by hanging, strangulations, and suffocation. And the correlation is around ninety-nine point seven nine percent. And logically, if you think about it, there is obviously there is no correlation between them uh, as in correlation as in causality it's not like spending on science is making people do suicides right similarly it's a very funny one number of people who drowned by failing into the pool i not uh, the drowning part is funny but like how the correlation is high with film nicholas cage appeared in again there is no causality, but you still see not as high correlation as earlier, but still a 66% correlation. So this was my uh, point about like why we should take EDA very seriously and how like learning more about the domain, you will definitely end up be uh, building better models because in the end, the data you provide the algorithm, they try to find the pattern. So if you do a good EDA, you will be able to create better features, which will be able to uh, which will help algorithm to find the patterns much quicker and you will end up with a better model so just to mention my team because see i'm working on so many projects so uh, my team has helped me in preparing this uh notebook because uh, uh something uh, i have i have two major notebooks to share with you and we are just going to come to that so no more wasting of time so this is my team Harsh Agarwal, Isha Tomre, Siddharth Kala, and Praveen TV. So one very important thing to note is Harsh Agarwal, Isha Tomre, and Siddharth, all three of them are products of Yoda. So now they are working in the company and they are helping us uh, uh, in solving all the real-time problems. Now, enough talking. As I said, let's get into the action. So what we'll do is I have uh, some uh, data, uh, load, uh, basically load data. Load data is, as I told you, the electricity demand data. So these are data for two different cities or state, and we will be doing a proper EDA, and uh, we'll try to take out things before doing any modeling anything. So that this whole session will be focused on EDA and how different kind of things you can do with the data and take out things from the data which you can de uh, definitely use while doing feature engineering so i will come to the q a part so let's go to the notebooks part first uh, so how i will be doing this is there i have made two very identical notebooks one notebook is for state a one notebook is for state b so both work in a way very similarly everything i'm doing is very similar but you will see how even though it's the same problem it's the load for it's the load that we are trying to uh, identify but how it's so different being the same thing and maybe i uh, i can tell you being still uh, these are two states in india itself but still how we can take out things so differently because we do a deep dive in uh, uh, while doing eda so i the plan is to run the notebook with you guys so I'm sorry if it uh, some cells might take a bit longer, but hopefully it should be uh, faster. Uh, so we are loading the data. So the data I uh, I've written everything. I tried to write it down so that even if like I miss something, you guys can read it. So I'm uh, loading the data. I can see there are more than uh, 
to a uh, two lakh rows, um, so two forty one thousand rows uh, data points. And one thing we can see easily is like the data is in fifteen minute granularity. So again, as I said, in India, the grid operates in a fifteen minute interval. So every load values, this is the power which was consumed uh, in this period. So this is the power, this is the date, and this is time block. TB is basically the time block. So in a day, if there are 15 intervals, so there will be 96 time blocks, every time block representing, uh, time block one would be the first uh, 15 minutes, time block two will be the next 15 minutes, and it goes on. And same thing will be happening here. I won't be running two notebooks because otherwise it will take too long. But the idea is we are doing the same thing. I'll shift the notebooks just to see how the things we are uh, taking out from uh, the EDA, how those things are different. So uh, I run this. I just make a copy because I'll be playing around with this a lot. Uh, info, you guys know, it's always good to check. Uh, your uh, uh, data frame, what are the data types of each column? So I think most of them are fine, but I'll still uh, uh, drop this TV column. I don't trust this uh, and I'll make it myself. So it's a very simple uh, formula I've used uh, to get uh, 96 time blocks uh, for each day. Date is, as you know, the PD dot date time. So uh, anything you don't understand, do ping me, but I think it's very straightforward. The point of this exercise, I don't think you will learn a lot about uh, something new about ED itself, but you will definitely learn how to do it, how to make this a habit whenever you start a new project. So this fun thing, I think data sanity check after working maybe more than three, four years in time series data, I think this is one must thing that everyone should do with the uh, time series data. So what happens is if you see my data is from 1st April 2016, and I tried to check if there is a missing value. It says no missing value. But this does not mean that there is no missing row in the data. So for example, uh, example, there is no row for 2016, 1st May at 1 p.m. So if the row is not there, it won't show any missing value. But this will affect uh, when you try to play with the time series data, because in time series data, you do have make a lot of features like uh, shifting the data by one block, or maybe if you want to create a target variable, you shift ahead and see. So if the time series value is missing, so this can affect uh, the any analysis you are doing. So always, uh, uh, what I personally do is, whatever the date range is, I create a new data frame, and uh, basically it will have all the dates and then I merge it with that data frame so that if there is any missing data, it will come out and we'll know. So now I'll check the missing value. It's still not there. Again, I'm doing very same things uh, in this data itself. So I just, I just done one thing because this data started from 2008. So I've just uh, uh, made a subset of the data and I'm taking just the data from 2016 because this data is also from 2016. Then this uh, any time series data you are dealing with, you tend to make create a lot of um, time series related uh, variable. So to catch the seasonality factor, all those factor and do analysis on that. So it's pretty straightforward. <clears throat> I'm creating all these variable. Uh, what, uh, date uh, is basically if it's date time, I get a date variable and then month. We take out the month from this year. We take out the e just the year part of this week which week is this of the year uh hour so which hour of the day it is it's the zero hour because it's 12 15 minute what minute data is this and then day again day of the year and this is the day of the week so i i think i'm converting day of the week as this also because while doing eda it will be much easier to have the day written instead of zero to six it can be sometimes confusing and I'm making another variable called weekend. So it will have all the Monday to uh, Friday as um, uh, weekend equal to zero and other uh, Saturday and Sunday as one. <clears throat> yeah. So I try to see the described column, but I see, okay, these variables, uh, I don't, it does not make sense for me to see all these uh, descriptions of for these. So I'll just see for load describe. So from the first analysis, we can see, okay, whatever the state is, the average load for this state is 524.98 megawatt. 
the minimum load is um, 93.15 i don't know uh, the value maybe this was not updated so it's 93.15 megawatt and uh, the maximum load is 917.55 megawatt so so we do this any random four sample again just the sanity i i try to do i check any duplicate value so these are the steps i am doing is because this these, these steps are very much required before you actually start making graphs so you need to know okay duplicates are not there missing values even if they are there you need to know first then again i'm checking another thing another sanity check so if uh, how many days uh, data there, there is for every year so for <clears throat> 2016 it's 275 and 23 is uh, 52 because obviously uh, this data starts in april so there are missing days this data is just still i think uh, last week or last to last week that's why just 52 days and we can see there is a leap year uh, as well in the middle so it's 366 days again i'm just writing it down so a very similar things i've done here uh same things i think uh here if you see the mean load is 600 which is higher than that the minimum load again is 174.34 which is higher than that and the maximum load is 1194.36 which is higher than that and then the data it has all the data and i think it's uh, ending some maybe the late months of 2022 so in last year it's not full and now we come to the eda part so this is where like uh, what I actually want to do in this session. So we go deep. I see we are a bit late on time. So I'll try to go much faster now. Uh, so this is the uh, so first thing we all do is just trying to do a load histogram plot. So just the histogram plot. So the histogram plot, it, tell, it tells us the distribution of the data set. So distribution are always useful for visualizing the shape and uh, uh, histograms are always use, uh, useful to, visu uh, to visualize the shape of the distribution, including its central tendency, variability. So it helps us in knowing like how our data is. So in terms of normal distribution, it looks like a normal distribution, but we will still need to see like if it's a normal distribution. Another very good way to plot and check if the data is normally distributed is a, a QQ plot. If someone doesn't know what is a QQ plot, it's just the uh, it's just how we uh, basically put our distribution on a normal normally distributed values, and we see how the overlap is. So to create a QQ plot, the ordered values. So the uh, the main thing is the ordered value of our data set will be plotted against a corresponding quantiles of theoretic, theoretical uh, normal distribution. And we see if the data follows normal distribution, the plot will be a straight line. If it deviates from the normal distribution plot, it will, uh, it will show maybe a curvature away. So you see, so if, the data is mostly following the normal distribution, but you see these tails are going away. So to interpret this is basically we can say our data is normally distributed, but it has fatter tails. So this is one thing we took. And I think I've worked with a lot of data, a lot of time series data of load, pi, solar generation, wind generation. Usually we do get data with fatter tails. Now we uh, look into the box plots and outliers. So box plot, uh, I'm uh, let uh, just to give you a brief what bo a box plot is. We try to have this uh, graphical representation of the distribution of the data set. It, it's a very good uh, way uh, to see visually the summary of how data is lying, where the mean, median, uh, the uh, Q1, Q4 is, maybe some outliers we can check. So in data set, we can see uh, there some, uh, according to box plot, there are some outliers above uh, this value. And there are some uh, outliers above this value. So like uh, how these things are calculated in technically it's calculated by interquartile range. So the formula for interquartile range is very simple. So we do calculate uh, uh, the quartiles, uh, then we subtract Q3 from Q1 that gives us the interquartile range. And then we subtract and add 1.5 uh, 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 of this in, into Q1 and Q3 to get uh, uh, the bands of uh, thresholds where above this value and below this value we uh, tend to say there are outliers. So if we run that, so we see there are 3,412 outliers. Now, now the thing is, it's a very, it's a one way to see outliers, but 
what exactly is an outlier so outlier in the data set is a, is an observation or a data point point which that differs significantly from other observations or data points so outliers can be caused by a factor reason maybe it was uh, the data was uh, measured wrong or the entry of the data was wrong or it can be occurring through a natural variability so if it occurs to, uh, because of natural variability then it is up to us whether so this is the part where again the domain comes in so if i straight away just follow iqr um, um, formula and i remove these 3 4 1 2 values uh, will that be a right thing to do so usually the best thing if you kind of uh, are in the similar situation you should always go to the domain expert now given we know it's a load data given we know it 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 uh, it is basically across maybe 6 7 years so we we will ask a domain expert who knows much more about like the load profiles of different state or a specific sp state we ask that person whether these values are um, uh, outliers or not so any basically it is saying any value greater than 821 should be an outlier which we don't know we uh, maybe it's true or maybe it's not so that is the point where we go to the domain expert and we ask him so this is one way you trying to understand much better about the data which if you straight away get give to the algorithm you might not get the answer then we see just the trends in load so this is how the load trend looks like uh, of this state now just to compare the same things uh, for the other state i will skip these part okay this is the trend that looks like for this state now just looking at this trend uh, maybe we can say obviously we can say one thing that the load profiles are totally different but we can't right now say a lot about the load profiles so we will try to dig in the first thing we can say is the first peak is coming around the morning hour so these are time blocks so if you divide by 4 it will give you the time so uh, this will this is somewhere around 10 am so if you see the peak is coming around 9 to 10 am and if you see here the peak is coming after 10 am so one thing we saw one difference we can easily see and then we see the p uh, the load drops suddenly and it picks up also this is average load across time but here i think it uh, drops smoothly and then uh, again rises around during the night time so it will be around 8 pm it uh, the second peak comes but here around 8 pm there is no peak so we can easily see these are two different um, load profiles and like for example if we have to build model for these two so will the independent variables the uh, the basically the independent variables we will give will they be different so this is what we want to dig now so now if we now we'll go and dig about these things like how exactly is the load profile so this is how the average max load is this is how the average mean load is this is how the average min load is and this is average average load so uh, if you see the pattern is almost similar for all three but here we see the pattern for max load is very different from pattern of low uh, min load and mean load so now we have another clue okay maybe these two profiles are very different uh how again how which uh, predictors will be necessary for uh, for us to use in order to predict the load better so what we'll do is we'll do next now yearly plots so one thing we can easily see how the data is moving across years right because it's very important one second i think it's loading mm, i think it's taking more time let's go to the other profile so yeah so this is uh, the other state and we can see so right now it's uh, we have to dig in not just observe we have to analyze what exactly is happening so we see the data in general the year wise it's increasing but suddenly we see why 2020 is so down there otherwise if you see 2016 then 17 18 19 um 20 was also a uh, 20 was there then 21 is also an odd year than 2022 so what happened in 2020 and 2021 that the load is so low but it's not the same case for 2021 later so 2021 uh, data is low in the uh, earlier time blocks here but here it's ki kind of picking up so this is one thing we have already noticed like normally in date uh, in the year 2021 otherwise 
the common pattern is there like we can see there is a common pattern and we can also see the load is increasing within uh, with the years and same thing we'll notice here so if you see again 2020 is down there but otherwise the load is increasing and i don't think 2021 has a major impact here but it's still lower than uh, there is some anomaly in 2021 data so now if we think about it why is that happening and one other thing is why is uh, uh the pattern is there any different pattern for anything so 2023 why is it so up so this reason is because the data for 2023 is not across the year it's just two months so it's representing the data for just two months so while doing eda you need to understand why this 2023 is so up so there is no nothing special happening in 2023 it's just that the other uh, years data is like across the years and but for 2023 it's just the first two months so now again, so we will try to dig deep into this and try to understand why is this happening. So when uh, this was uh, the load profile for 96 time blocks, now we are seeing that across months, like how the data is across months. So if you see, I can see that the uh, load is almost kind of similar across the whole year. Like there is, I mean, it, Gets, it's higher maybe in the starting constant in the middle and higher again in the end. But now if you go to the other state, you see how the data is so different across months. So in the starting months, it's very low. And in the middle months, it's very high. And later again, it's very low. So again, you can see how seasonality might be playing a very different role for both these load profiles. Now, again, what are the observation? We again see the 2020 April data, there is something wrong. So now if you think about it, uh, the, if this is India's data, the COVID uh, first lockdown came in the month of end of March and April. So that is how, that is why the load is so less. So one, one thing we can easily take out is the, we can easily see the COVID effect here. And even if you remember in India, the second wave of COVID came in, early 2021, not as early as 2022, it's April, May type, the 2021, uh, in 2021, the COVID wave came. And again, we can see how it is affecting. Maybe the effect on 2021 data on this state is not that much, but if you see this state, 2020, you can see so uh, like the change in load pattern and 2021 also, you can easily see. So if you're trying to make a, a model for current day, so will you take this data in, in the training set or not? This is a, now a good question you have uh, because you can see you have reasons why it won't be appropriate. So this is the kind of uh, thing we are already observing in the data. Now we'll see how the data is across uh, and different, um, I think, uh, different weeks. So, uh, so it will be very similar to uh, months. Uh, it's just a bit, uh, bit more information, so we can skip that. Now we see how the data is across years, right? So we have already seen one thing that the load data is increasing. There is an outlier in 2020. Then again, it starts to increase. And I think similarly, we can see the same thing. <laughs> The data is increasing slightly, slightly in 19. Then it comes, I think the COVID effect on this state is much higher. And then again, it starts to increase. And second thing we are noticing is there are some outliers we can see again in the data. I mean, I'm using the word outliers because uh, in box plot, we tend to say these points as outlier. But as I told earlier, that because we know the data, we know the domain expert, it might not be the outlier. It might, uh, there is, there might be other reason why load is increasing and why, and that value is actually possible. It's a natural occurrence, not a, basically a, a mistake or a wrong entry. Similarly here also, we can see a lot of outliers. So now if we go and see monthly plots, so monthly plots will again help us in understanding how the data is across months. So if you see the months number are easy. So April month, we see the load is the least and May again, it's very less. So we see the months between uh, summer and winter, the load is not that high. Uh, even summer months, you see it's constant, but for winter months, 12 to one, which is basically December, January, Feb, the load is the highest for state this. But if you go to this state, 
I mean, monthly load pattern, it's not running. So let's just run this. So <clears throat> now if you see, it's a complete different story. Every month has a very, very, very unique pattern. I mean, you can club few months. So if you see the winter months have a very low load in the starting of the day and uh, summer months have a very high load even at the starting. But uh, during the middle, it's uh, obviously in summer, it's much higher. But there are some months, if you see, like this orange month, which is May, it starts high, but it does not go as high as other uh, summer months. But uh, during night and during morning, it's almost the same. So maybe you think this is more of a state where we have extreme weather, like, for example, states like Delhi. So in Delhi, if you see, summers are very hot, winters are very cold and uh, not and not as cold as uh, maybe states which are in uh, Himalayas or maybe countries that are in Europe. So there the winters are very cold. They, the, the temperature goes uh, even below zero. So that's again it's something about the load profile. So it's not a state where winter is increasing the load, but we observe winters very, very prominently because the load drops. But in this state, we see the winter months have the highest uh, load. So we kind of figuring it out without even knowing where the data, where the geography is. We are still figuring out, okay, for these states, uh, the load is high uh, for winters. So maybe it's a state somewhere there and we can already think maybe the winter months will be difficult to capture. So if you are a data scientist, you know every time where there is an extreme value, it's more difficult to capture. And if you see the winter months in this these states, whichever the state is, I think the winter months will be easier to capture. The peaks are not there. And usually the data is very close to each other. But in summer, you see the data is very, very diverse. It can go up and down. So it's very difficult to forecast from a data scientist point of view. So now, <clears throat> <laughs> again, the observations, I've already told uh, a lot of them. So again, if you want to have, uh, as I said, like you can easily point it out, like what is the load profile? So it's a profile where it must, the winters are very cold, the summers are fine. So it can be a state or a city somewhere in the north, very north, uh, maybe in Himalayas. <laughs> and this is a state maybe more like, <clears throat> I would say, uh, a city like Delhi, where uh, or maybe neighboring uh, states of Delhi, where uh, the load is uh, falling in a uh, pattern of weather, where like summers are extreme, uh, summer uh, hot, so the load is very high, and winters are colder, so the load is very low. Given that uh, the geyser load is there, but it's like not like in India, everyone is using heater or geyser, so maybe geyser load will be there, but yeah, maybe geyser load can be seen. My early, so if you see the difference between these two is maybe th this can be the geyser load. This is the morning time where people are getting up. So maybe that's where you can see the geyser load. So these are small, small things which we can see from the visualization itself. And we can validate these things if we go and talk to a domain expert. <clears throat> now, uh, I know the time is running. So if I go faster, uh, so again, these are same things I'm doing. And uh, now I'm doing for different hours, the how the load profile is across the months as we have established the winter months, the load is higher, which if we see in this state, uh, so it's easy to see that summers, the load is very high, even the outliers are there. You know, the outliers, it will bring us to, an, uh, to a point that why do you think the load is getting so high? So this basically means maybe the temperature is very high. So if you are uh, now, I have also done some weekday weekend analysis. It's a very good predictor to give if you're forecasting for load, right? So does the load profile uh, differ if it's a weekday or weekend? So if we see here, so like Sunday, the load is the minimum, but Saturday, it, it does not matter. So again, if you have to think about this state and if you have to make a model about this state, would you give, uh, would you consider uh, this uh, uh, maybe a weekend as a separate uh, indicator or you just have Sunday as a separate predictor. And if you go to this state, I'll, I'm just moving faster uh, 
thinking about the time so here you see like saturday and sunday are much different from other days of the week and maybe here if you give a give a, maybe a weekend predictor it will be help it will help the model to predict these two uh, the uh, data profile or the load profile of these two better again so these are things you do now you can even here the idea is to see how the variability is there across days uh, within the data so if i see like the sunday has the lowest minimum load of the week as well as the lowest maximum so sunday is a clear we know that it's the load is the least but somehow thursday and tuesday they they have uh, thursday if you see thursday and tuesday they have more similar load than maybe monday and wednesday i maybe we don't know the reason why is that but from the data we can see they are much similar like uh, we'll go to the next block and here also we'll see so if you see sunday uh, is down there and saturday in the morning it's high but uh, during the afternoon it is quite uh, similar to sunday even below sunday uh, uh, in some time blocks but if you see now if you see other load patterns see monday and wednesday are together and tuesday wednesday uh, tuesday th uh, friday and thursday are together so again these are things which you are visualizing and now you will have to think like why is this happening do maybe because of the new office culture maybe this is affecting the load profile for different days people tend to go to office on some particular days and some particular day they tend to stay at home so now these things are basically deriving the load profiles and if you give the data directly to the algorithm there is a chance that algorithm might not be able to pick these things up as fast as or maybe you need a lot of data for algorithms to pick all these patterns up right so these are the things uh, we do from eda again so i will skip some of the part because of the time so another thing i wanted to, to wanted to try was to include weather so if you think about load how is load affecting us so load is usually affecting us because uh, the way we feel uh, that the temperature the weather around us so if it's very hot and i'm in living in delhi so i will definitely uh, switch on my ac right so this will affect the load and if it's uh, if it's the month of april for example or maybe i would say march so there it's not as cold so you will maybe not switch on the ac and it's not as hot so you won't be even using heaters and uh, geysers so maybe technically march will have the least load so how so that's where the weather comes in so what if like we start giving weather data to our model and see how the load is reacting with that so i've done some work with the weather again some data sanity che checks uh, interpolating some missing values i would want to go much deeper in this but uh, i can see the time uh, is clocking so uh, let me just show some of the findings so <clears throat> now we are at the temperature so we see there is a temperature it's very seasonal like we can easily see the seasonality which is not not a surprise to us like we know like uh how the temperature across day across months across years uh it's pretty much uh, following a cycle so uh in this maybe in this state i've taken temperature from four different location and i've tried to visualize how it is then uh, somehow i see the patterns are similar maybe uh, the magnitude is different but the pattern is quite similar so i've just uh, for simplicity uh, uh, sake i've taken temperature just one temperature to do our analysis so now we see how the temperature moves so again eda is not just about uh, the uh, the variable that you uh, that is the target variable you have to understand what other features you are giving so it's kind of a tedious process you need to dig deep but that's where you will find the gold right so so now we see that the highest temperature is usually across around 40 degrees and the minimum temperature is near 0 degrees so we know that and then we see how the temperatures are across uh, different uh, months so it's easy to see like the summer months will have higher temperature and winter months have lower temperature this will be different if we were taking maybe a, uh, a load profile of some country in the southern hemisphere so there it might be different right so <clears throat> mean temperature within uh, different years so uh, if you see even though year in the in the, the short a span it should not make that difference i think 2016 is above there is because there are no data from january to march so those are the 
colder months so average temperature is higher but one shocking thing is how 2022 is so high so this 2022 is uh, one second i'm sorry um yeah so this 2022 date a uh, temperature increasing is uh, a living example that there is uh, like climate change is affecting uh, the temperature all across the world i know like one year can be an outlier but this is a trend we are seeing like we are experiencing warmer and warmer temperature and similarly i think just to make a point uh, much uh, an important point in this state we saw how um, we uh, this state is more vulnerable to uh, the summer months are uh, they have a very high peak load so if you think about 2022 uh, the climate changes and the increase in temperature that should have an uh, even important role so if you see in this state also the temperature is much higher than the other state so this will play a very big role on like how the load peak will be different and again as a data scientist uh, it's always the most difficult job to capture that peak in the data the average values are easier to capture right especially like if you are running a uh, gradient boosting model so uh, a value which has not never uh, which we have never seen in the training set it will never predict and like when you see like uh, examples like these where the temperature is in a category which is unknown so in gradient boosting it will be just uh, li- like a bifurcation if it's greater than 30 the load should be this but in real life if the temperature actually is going beyond a value which was never seen so the load will also be affected and it will reach a value which is much higher than it has ever reached so these are the things you capture when you do a proper ela so i know i am already out of time and me uh, maybe i will share the slides uh, it's basically talking about again the point of this whole uh, session was not to teach you some new eda technique but it's to teach you uh, like how important doing a proper uh, eda is like how you can take out insights and do even better feature engineering and be- build better models if you understand what data you are working with if you have do- domain expertise to help you okay this value is possible this is not possible it's an interesting point so this was the gist of it uh i hope you guys understood it maybe we take some questions and um, uh because we are already above time we end the session okay hi shubham uh are you there yes sir guys uh, please uh, let, uh, give me a minute uh as we proceed towards asking uh, you know answering your questions please be kind enough to fill the feedback forms okay so i can see some questions on the chat itself so the george is asking what is the cost of yuda's program so uh, george uh, it's a program where we pay people to come and uh, uh, take the yuda's program program obviously you have to clear the entrance test it's a very basic test uh, like we want you to at least know basic maths uh, fundamental maths and fundamental statistics uh, if you clear that we take you and uh, it's a, it's a program where we pay and it's a, it's a virtual program so you can take it from anywhere in the world there is no need to come or you don't need to be in india so i'll take some other question so you can provide the formula for tb generation yes it's a very simple i can tell you it's very simple uh, and i'll be sharing my notebook so you will get uh, the formula how the time block is defined for in case of month uh, series 12 months how to define tb so uh, okay so time block thing is actually uh, uh, an interesting thing so what we do is so whatever the r is we just multiply it by 4 and then whatever the minutes are we just uh, divide it by 15 getting it to a round number so we will def- like for example if we are in uh, maybe we start with the first example if it's 115 so right now the time is 115 so r into 4 is like uh, 
plus 15 divided by uh, 15, which will be 1. So 4 plus 1 will be 5. So because 1 15th is the fifth time lock, because first was 12 to 12 15, second is 12 15 to 12 30, third is 12 30 to 12 45, fourth is uh, 12 to 1. So this is the fifth time lock. So that's how you calculate it. And uh, the formula is there in the uh, notebook. So we can do that. To become a good data scientist, what should be the correct roadmap? <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't know, like uh, every person's journey is uh, very different. Uh, always play to your strengths. Like, for example, I am an economist, so I do play to my strengths. I use try to use my economist, uh, whatever I've learned as an economist, I try to bring that perspective. I might not be as good as someone who has uh, coded or uh, coded, uh, has been doing coding all his life. But uh, like I can always learn that thing and uh, try to use whatever uh, um, strengths I have while solving something. So can you share this notebook? Yes, it, it will be shared. What is the scenario in which both you do visualization in EDA phase? Um, what is the scenario in which both you do? I don't understand the question. You can ask me later. As a data scientist, which PC I should buy? <laughs> so. These are good questions, guys. But uh, I, uh, what ID you are using? So these are very. Uh, I think these questions, obviously, as a new data scientist, these are very, very important questions. But I can tell you just one thing. I mean, it might not. It might not sound like an advice, but be, uh, follow something which you are uh, familiar with. I don't think there is a best ID. Otherwise, everyone would be using that best ID, right? There is a best laptop. Like for example, I always work in Mac. There is no reason that Mac is superior than any other uh, laptops, but I am very comfortable with the whole Apple ecosystem. So I've been using Mac. And for ID, I usually work with uh, Spider and Jupyter Notebook. Spider is mostly uh, when I have to do a lot of, um, like I, if I have to deploy models on uh, live servers, I have to do debugging. Jupyter is more when I'm doing uh, visualization, I want to present something. Uh, which I've done very interesting. So Jupyter can be converted into HTML, PDF. So that way it's very good. Uh, so uh, Shubham, so how do we do this? So, so I think if you have answered all the questions, so I think <laughs> we can conclude the position. So okay. it's mostly about share the notebooks and data sets okay. and everything. So that will be done and about questions about Yodas. So Yodas, uh, I can share uh, with uh, analytics with you. There is a website about Yodas. You guys can log on to that and learn a lot about it. Like what Yodas is, what do we teach and everything. And yeah, uh, I think anything else you have my Twitter handle, you have my LinkedIn, you can just connect me there. Uh, thank you guys for being such a uh, such a good audience and uh, all the best. Uh, take care. Yeah, thank you, Shubham, for the session. Thanks, thanks a lot, Akash. On behalf of Anand Kitizdeya, I'd like to thank you for your time and for del delivering such a wonderful session. I'm sure thank our you. audience found it insightful and hopefully we can conduct more such session with you in the future. Sure. Now, guys, thank you. Uh, I would request you all to please fill the feedback form because it helps us to conduct more such sessions. And if you in case if you have a, you, if you are facing any issues or in registering or connecting with us please uh, you know write us a mail at editor and click at the rate and dot com and as you all know like the recording of the session will be available within two days on our youtube channel and i guess this is the end so we'll be back with another, another session of the data the link is in the chat section till then bye bye and keep learning thank you sir bye bye